All right, so it's been about two weeks since I received and started using my Mac Mini powered by the M1 processor. Now within those two weeks, my experience has been somewhat of a mixed bag, but in today's video, I wanna focus on just one part of that experience, and that's gonna be video editing. So in today's video, we're gonna be figuring out the new Mac Mini can edit 4K, 6K, and even 8K raw footage. But before we begin this video, my name is Fran and here on the channel I make videos all about technology. I do reviews, I do opinion pieces, and sometimes they even test out brand new Mac Mini. So if you like what you see in today's video thus far, consider hitting that subscribe button down below. All right, so within the last two weeks, a lot has happened in my main workstation. I've gone ahead and taken out my 16 inch MacBook Pro and my custom built PC, and I've replaced both of them with this single Mac Mini. So I'm fully embracing the M1 ecosystem, and so far this is the only system I've been using for browsing the internet, as well as doing any type of video editing. Now, making this transition hasn't exactly been super smooth, and it definitely comes with its own set of challenges, but I'll try to save that for my full review of the Apple M1 ecosystem. For now, I'm only gonna talk about one challenge, and that one pertains to Final Cut, but we'll get to that a little bit later in the video. So in today's Can It Edit 4K, 6K, and 8K video tests, I wanna take a look at three NLEs, Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve, Adobe's Premiere Pro, and Apple's Final Cut. And though this isn't a versus video, I do plan on throwing in some of the results in my 16-inch MacBook Pro, just so we have a baseline for performance. And really quickly, let's take a look at the specifications of our test machine. Now, when it comes to the M1 Mac Mini, I upgraded the only two categories that you're actually able to upgrade on the Apple website, that's gonna be unified memory from eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes, and the internal storage from 256 gigabytes up to 512. Everything else is pretty much as it is. And then when it comes to our 16 inch MacBook Pro, you guys have seen it here in the channel before, but I'll go ahead and leave the specs for those up here on the screen. All right, so first up is DaVinci Resolve. Now for this particular test, we'll be using DaVinci Resolve 16. Not DaVinci Resolve Studio 16, not DaVinci Resolve 17. That's because the latter is still in beta and the former requires a license. Now the reason why I'm mentioning this is because some of the sample footage that we're gonna actually be using throughout the rest of the test is gonna be 10-bit 422. And unfortunately, when you're not using Studio, you don't have support for that 10-bit 422, only 8-bit 420. All right, so the first category that I wanna cover is stability, or does DaVinci Resolve crash? Now the answer to this question is yes. DaVinci Resolve crashed and locked up on me multiple times during my testing. However, there is a wild card that might be playing into this, and that's gonna be Mac OS Big Sur. You see, Apple's made a number of changes in this version of the operating system. And for me, typically, I like to wait a couple of subversions before I upgrade any of my machines to the latest version of Mac OS. Now, because of that, I'm not 100% sure if these issues are actually related to Big Sur or if these issues have anything to do with the fact that it's running via Rosetta on top of an Apple Mac Mini with M1 processor. And there's also DaVinci Resolve's track record of instability across more traditional x86-based Macintosh computers anyway. So I guess this is a really long way of answering the question as not applicable. The next category is timeline playback and scrubbing. So when importing Blackmagic RAW footage shot on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K and 6K in B-RAW, the playback experience was super smooth. I was able to actually play back all the footage without any type of issues or any type of hiccups, even after I added a couple of title animations as well as transition effects. However, when attempting to manipulate 8K RAW footage shot off of a Canon R5, the experience was nowhere near the same. Playback of the footage actually experienced a number of frame drops and attempting to scrub through the footage just was almost impossible. Then once you added a color grade or any type of graphical overlays and transitions, it just further made the editing experience that much worse. And finally, when it comes to delivering my final edit, my container of choice happens to be H.264 or Apple's ProRes. And when it comes to rendering times for these final exports, well, I'll leave the results up on the screen and let the render time speak for themselves. And now let's take a look at Adobe Premiere Pro. All right, so the first category is stability. Now Adobe Premiere Pro actually scored the worst in this category out of all three of the NLEs. I had issues with the application locking up on me, had issues with the application launching the Adobe Media Encoder for me to actually do any of my tests that I was doing for this particular video. Then I had issues actually starting and even stopping the application. I continuously had to actually force quit or restart my entire system. Now, of course, once again, Adobe Premiere Pro does have its own bad track record when it comes to stability on more traditional x86-based applications. However, what I experienced on the M1 Mac Mini was a little bit above and beyond normal. And now, let's talk about timeline playback and scrubbing. Now, once again, in this particular category, Adobe Premiere Pro did the worst out of all three of the NLEs. Now, if you were to throw some HI264 footage shot in 8-bit 420, it actually handled it fairly well. 
even if you were to throw a couple of color grades on it and maybe some graphical overlays, there wasn't much of a problem when it came to this footage. But if you threw anything else at it, such as 10-bit 422, B-RAW, B-RAW 4K, B-RAW 6K, and even Canon RAW, this is actually where you saw Adobe Premiere Pro slow down to a crawl. In fact, if you were to combine the actual performance of Adobe Premiere Pro with all of the crashing, I would actually call it borderline unusable. Now, of course, while this isn't a versus video, I did try the same exact footage on my 6-inch MacBook Pro, and I got much better results. Now, once again, the final category that we'll look at here is gonna be delivery. Now, when it comes to Adobe Premiere Pro, my container of choice happens to be H.265. Now, go ahead and leave the results up on the screen once again, but as you guys can see, the 6-inch MacBook Pro pulls ahead of the M1 Mac Mini. And now, let's talk about Apple's Final Cut Pro. Now, as to be expected, considering Apple makes Final Cut, there's absolutely no issues when it comes to stability with Final Cut running on Apple Silicon. It's native to the operating system, um, not having any issues with the crashing, any issues with the locking up or anything like that. Now, there are two problems with Apple's Final Cut Pro running on the Apple M1 that I felt like were worth mentioning here in this video. Problem number one has to do with the plugins. Now, while in my first video, I did mention a number of my plugins do not work. Uh, since then, publishers have continuously been releasing updates to these plugins to work with Apple Silicon, but even till this day, there still are a very large number of plugins that still do not work. And for problem number two, which is a much smaller problem and could have something to do with Apple's Big Sur, traditionally when you plug in external media to your computer when you have Final Cut Pro running, it actually would pop up a dialog to allow you to automatically import all of that footage into Final Cut. However, in this current version running on the Mac Mini M1, that dialog does not pop up and the only way to get it to pop up is if you actually restart Final Cut. So once again, not a really big problem, but something worth mentioning. And then when it comes to timeline performance and playback, while unfortunately Final Cut Pro does not support B-RAW files, so no 4K and 6K footage coming off of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, however, everything else that we threw at it, it worked absolutely flawlessly. So we're talking HI-264, HI-265, 420 footage, 422 footage, and even the footage that was shot on the Canon R5, meaning the 8K RAW, as well as the H.265 422 footage, which is notoriously bad on pretty much all computers out there in the market. And as a side note, in case anyone out there is wondering, I did keep enabled in the options background rendering. I noticed a lot of reviewers actually disabling this before doing their tests in Final Cut Pro. I'm not sure why. If I'm gonna have a feature that's gonna enhance my timeline performance, I'm definitely gonna keep it enabled at all times. However, I did not enable proxy or optimize media upon media import in case you're wanting that as well. And then finally, when it comes to a final edit delivery, my container of choice in Final Cut Pro, once again, is HI-265 10-bit, and I'll go ahead and leave the results of that final export up on the screen and let the results speak for themselves. All right, guys, so after looking at all of the test results, it's pretty clear to see that the new M1 Mac Mini is an extremely impressive machine. This $1,200 computer pretty much went round for round with my $4,500 MacBook laptop, and that's extremely impressive. Now, in some tests, we did see the 16-inch MacBook Pro perform significantly better than the Mac Mini, but considering it costs four times the amount of money, that's to be expected. And not to mention that the Mac Mini did keep up with the 16-inch MacBook Pro while sounding whisper quiet, unlike our MacBook Pro, which pretty much sounded like a gen engine. So to answer that initial question of this video, can you edit 4K, 6K, and even 8K footage on the M1 Mac Mini? The answer to that question is, as you can tell from the test results, Yes, yes you can, depending on what editing software you use. In our testing, we saw Adobe Premiere Pro perform horribly when it comes to overall stability, as well as timeline playback and scrubbing of most common video codecs, but then surprisingly perform fairly well when it comes to final edit delivery. Then when it comes to DaVinci Resolve, we saw decent performance when it comes to stability and really good performance when it comes to timeline scrubbing and playback, at least with the B-RAW codec. However, unfortunately, when it comes to some of the other more common codecs, such as HI-265, it suffers from the same performance problems that Adobe Premiere Pro does. And then finally, when it comes to Apple's Final Cut, as to be expected, it pretty much worked flawlessly as it is optimized for Apple Silicon. But one important thing to remember with all of these tests is that Adobe Premiere Pro and Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve 
Resolve are running on top of emulators within the operating system. And if there's one thing that we can take away from the performance and stability of Apple's Final Cut Pro, which is actually built for native Apple Silicon, is that once Blackmagic and Adobe update their editing applications to be native for Apple Silicon, we're gonna see way better performance and way better stability. We might even see something that rivals the performance of Apple's Final Cut Pro. But as far as my recommendation for the folks out there who are considering switching over to the M1 Mac Mini exclusively for video editing, my recommendation goes something like this. If you are a non-working professional without a powerful Intel Macintosh computer already, and you either don't use Final Cut Pro plugins or the plugins that you do use, you've already verified that they have been updated for Apple Silicon, then I say absolutely sure. Go for it. However, for the working professionals out there, or for the folks who already have a powerful Intel Macintosh computer, or even for the folks who use Adobe Premiere Pro, I personally would stay far away from this as of right now, simply because of all the bugs when it comes to instability with some of those other editing applications. But that is going to wrap this video up. As always, if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to leave them down in the comment section below. Also, while you guys are down there, if you like this video, hit the like button. And if it's your first time to the channel, consider subscribing. Once again, guys, my name is Fran. Thanks for checking out this video. I'll see you guys in my next one.